This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. I'm seated right now in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. The day my mind is alert, my spirit is receptive as I am taught the Word of God. My life is changed for the better. And I will never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. And as you're being seated, if you would, in your Bible, turn to the book of Acts, chapter 9. The book of Acts, chapter 9. For some time now, we've been in a series called Miracles of the New Testament. We're now in the book of Acts, working our way through these wonderful miracles to learn the patterns, the principles to apply to our own lives. In December, pastor challenged us to believe God for a doubling in 2024. And I believe that with the Lord, all things are possible, but that requires that we do our part. And on Vision Sunday, January 7th this year, pastor challenged all of us to focus on doing four things this year. That when we're in town, we're not we're traveling or on vacation, but when we're in town, to be in church when the doors are open. Second, to not just arrive when we arrive, but to arrive on time or early and to worship the Lord enthusiastically. Number three, to tell at least one person about Jesus every month. You know, you may be shy or you may not be shy and your, your goal is to tell 10 people or a dozen people. That's wonderful. But number three, for each of us to commit and to challenge ourselves to tell at least one person about the Lord every month. And finally, number four, for each of us to challenge ourselves to pray for at least one person who is in need in their body in person every month. And we believe that if we will all commit to doing these things this year, our lives will change for the better. It's a new year. So it's a time to reevaluate. It's a time to pray. It's a time to be led by the Holy Spirit. What needs to change? What needs to improve? What needs to be done differently or done better? And so in each of our lives, we have to ask ourselves, are we taking action? Do we see our prayers being answered? Do we see God moving in our lives the way we want him to move in our lives? And our attitude should be, my attitude is that I want all that our heavenly father has for me. I want more. Paul, told, Paul tells us that he will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask, think, or imagine. So I not only want what I desire, but I want all that my heavenly Father desires for me. So have ears to hear, have ears to hear. And when we gather for church, listen, take notes, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. To end the year in a better place, we each have to take responsibility for our lives and circumstances. We each have to take greater action. In Acts chapter nine, Saul, who had been the persecutor of the church, Saul is miraculously converted. On the road to Damascus, Saul has an encounter with the risen, resurrected Christ. Suddenly there is a blinding light. There is an audible voice from heaven. Lord Jesus says to Saul, 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 why do you persecute me? And long story short, Saul comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He is filled with the Spirit, and Saul, the persecutor, begins preaching fearlessly, and the Bible says, speaking boldly in the name of Jesus. Luke then tells us in Acts 9, verse 31, then the church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, and it grew in numbers, living in the fear of the Lord. And I believe that that is the Lord's will for us in 2024, that we have a time of peace, that we be strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, that we grow in numbers as we live in the fear 
of Almighty God. In 2024, don't just focus on you and what you've got going on in your life. Pray for others. Intercede for others. Tell at least one person about the Lord every month. And pray for at least one person who is sick in their body every month. I've been rehearsing the past few weeks what Teal Osborne would often say, and that is this, what God has done in your life, the Lord now wants to do through your life. Pray that we would see many people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ this year. Pray that we would see many filled with the Holy Spirit and many discipled this year in 2024. And let's pray and be in agreement and confess that this year will be a time of peace when we are strengthened and encouraged, growing in numbers as we live in the fear of the Lord. So in Acts chapter 9, after a time of persecution, the church in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and beyond enjoyed a time of peace, strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. And amazing miracles continue to take place. Now, when you read your Bible, you have to be careful because it's so easy to read about the life of Abraham and come to the conclusion that the Lord spoke to Abraham on Monday, then the Lord spoke to Abraham on Tuesday, and everything amazing in Abraham's life happened by Friday. And to do that when we read the historical books or to do that when we read something like the book of Acts. So you got to slow down and pause and, and remember that not everything happens in seven days. And so here in Acts chapter 9, this is at least about eight years after the day of Pentecost, so nearly a decade. Acts 9, beginning in verse 36, in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. You know, people talk about religion. You read the book of James, you find out what James calls good religion, which is being a help, being a blessing, being concerned about those in need. And again, Tabitha is an example of that. About that time, she became sick and died. Now here in a few moments, we'll deal with death. We'll deal with what the New Testament has to say about death. If you've been at Faith Christian Center a while, you've learned that because of Adam's sin, sickness, poverty, and death entered into the world. And you've learned that we're, we're, we're clear. John 10, 10 is the dividing line of the Bible. If they're stealing, killing, and destroying, that's the enemy. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have life more abundantly. But the reality is because we live in this sinful, fallen world, there are things that we face, there are things that we deal with, there are things that have to be overcome. And the Bible tells us about that time she became sick and died. Her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Verse 40, Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and he prayed. Why did Peter do what he did? And why did Peter minister in the way that he ministered? Peter walked with Christ. And Peter saw the Lord Jesus Christ minister. And Peter saw how the Lord Jesus Christ not only handled easy situations, he saw how the Lord Jesus Christ handled difficult situations. We would get better results if in difficult situations, we would first pray and seek direction from the Lord. We would get better results if in difficult situations, we would first pray and seek direction from the Lord. When Jesus raised the daughter of Jairus from the dead, Jesus only allowed the girl's parents in the room, along with Peter, James, and John. Peter saw firsthand how the Lord ministered and how the Lord operated. And there, there's a principle there that in a difficult moment, in a difficult situation, you've got to get doubt and you've got to get unbelief out of the room. You've got to get grief and sorrow and all those things out of the room. Otherwise, 
How can you focus to pray? How can you focus to have the mind of Christ and the wisdom of God? How, how can you focus to pray and to seek the leading of the Holy Spirit to know what to do and, and what to say? So Peter saw firsthand how the Lord Jesus ministered. And so like Jesus, Acts 9, verse 40, Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and he prayed. And why would he do that? Why would he first pray? Well, to seek direction in this particular situation. Luke doesn't tell us. Maybe he knew, maybe he didn't. But Luke does not tell us how old Tabitha was. We don't know if she was a middle-aged woman. We don't know if she was a senior citizen. Luke does not tell us, so we do not know. What we do know is that Peter got down on his knees and he prayed. We would get better results if in difficult situations we would first pray and seek direction from the Lord. Pray first. I I, I know we live in this society of all this technology and that there's this feeling we have that if we don't like someone's Facebook post quick enough or comment congratulations quick enough. They'll think we we don't like them and we're not their friend anymore. And and we live in this microwave society where everything has got to happen in the next five seconds or the next five minutes. And, you know, I, I remember being in college and hearing about Amazon and thinking, man, I'm going to order a book. How cool is this? I don't have to go to Barnes and Noble. I'm going to order a book and it's going to come in the mail. And I remember that getting one of the first couple packages and my father thinking, that's so odd. And eventually he thought, that's cool, you can order books in the mail. Well, now you can have all kinds of things and they show up at your house by 3 p.m. today. You know, if Jessica stopped ordering for a week or two, Amazon would probably reach out to, to check on her. <laughs> to make, maybe they have pastoral reach out, I don't know. We, we live in this society where things happen so quickly and so fast, and with all this technology, you know, there, there used to be a time that you could not get a hold of someone every second of every hour of every day. You know, I remember when my father had one of those great big portable phones for emergencies only, or an important pastoral call or situation. That, that, was, that was what it was for. But now, you know, you're, you're going about your life doing this or that, and you're getting text messages and updates on social media and all of that. So there's this pressure that we got to decide what we're doing right now in the next 10 minutes. There's, there's this pressure. You know, it could be a major decision about life and dating and marriage or about a career. We got to decide right now. We got to decide that we can't wait till tomorrow. We would get better results if in difficult or important situations in life, we would first pray and seek direction from the Lord. Pray first. Seek direction first. Listen for the leading and the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. Marilyn Hickey would always teach to follow the peace of God. And if you don't have peace about something, it's not right. It's not not the Lord. It's not the will of God. And you might say, well, Austin, they're putting all this pressure on me. I got to decide and have a decision by noon tomorrow. That's them. That's the world. That's not the Lord. If we want Bible results, we have to learn from the Lord and from those who walked with them. If you want Bible results, you got to do things the Bible way. Acts 9 verse 40, Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and he prayed. That's exactly what Elisha did. 2 Kings 4 verse 32 with the son of the Shunammite woman. Acts 4.32 says, When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and prayed to the Lord. So again, we would get better results if in difficult situations we would first pray and seek direction from the Lord. Peter saw firsthand how the Lord Jesus Christ operated and minister. Now Paul tells us in his letters that God gives gifts unto men, unto us, under the church, under the body of Christ. And there are apostles, there are prophets, there are pastors and teachers, or as Kenneth Hagin Sr. taught, there is the pastor teacher, and there are 
evangelists. The apostle Paul was an apostle. Barnabas was an apostle. Apollos was an apostle. Junia was an apostle. And then there were a group of men that we see defined in Acts chapter 1. You go back to the Gospels, early in his ministry, after he had been baptized, Jesus spent the entire night in prayer. And after spending a night in prayer, he chose 12 men and designated them apostles. One of them betrayed the Lord. His name was Judas. Acts chapter 1, he was replaced with Matthias. But Peter gave the criteria for someone to step into that role and to replace Judas. They had to have been present with the Lord Jesus Christ from when he was baptized, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. Peter walked with Jesus. Peter saw the Lord Jesus Christ multiply the loaves and the fishes on more than one occasion. Peter was there when they were outside this rural town name and a mother, her only son had died. They were carrying the body out. Peter saw the Lord Jesus reach out his hand and that boy be raised to life. Peter was one of the three at Jairus' house. By the time they got there, the girl was dead. And so the Lord put everyone out except Jairus and his wife. And he only took three of the 12. He only took three in with him. Peter, James, and John. And Peter was there. He saw, he heard when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to that little girl. Talitha Kum, I say to you, get up. He was there. He saw, he heard. And he was with the Lord outside Jerusalem when a, when a friend of theirs had died, Lazarus. He was there and Peter saw and Peter heard when the Lord Jesus Christ stood there and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, not for my benefit, for theirs. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. Peter was there and Peter saw and Peter heard. And so Peter, the fisherman, despite his faults, despite his denial of the Lord, he was there and he saw and he ministered the way Jesus ministered. He was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the things you find out in doing the daily Bible reading and studying the New Testament is that an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ has the authority to command life and death. Now, we already saw the death side with Ananias and Sapphira. But here we see Peter with the authority delegated by Christ speaking life. It's important that we as Christians have a biblical New Testament understanding of death. The Bible speaks of God limiting the number of days of men's years because of man's wickedness to 120. David later speaks of 70, that if one lives to be 70, that's a good thing. We ought to be thankful. We ought not lament that. It is important that we as believers have a biblical understanding of death. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. When a believer dies and steps into eternity, they are with the Lord. And as we see in this passage, Tabitha was with the Lord. Now, Peter will say, he's about to say, get up. But he, she was with the Lord. Whether young or old, tragic, untimely, or simply the body wearing out of old age. When a believer steps into eternity, they are with the Lord. So we do not grieve like those who have no hope. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. Now, some people wrongly take that to mean that there's a set day 
there's a set time. I don't believe that. My father doesn't believe that. The truth is that if the Lord tarries, all of us, no matter how long we live, that this body, this flesh will wear out. And there's coming a day when we will step into eternity to be with the Lord. It is appointed unto man once to die. You can exercise, you can drink all the, the, sm the smoothies and the shakes, take all the vitamins you want to take. There are billionaires that do all kinds of rejuvenation treatments. Doesn't change the fact that in this sinful fallen world, it is appointed unto man once to die. So we are to have a biblical New Testament understanding of death. And I want to say this because there are a lot of young people here. Life is a gift. The breath of God that each of us has, it is a gift. And I don't care whether young or old. I don't care how bad any situation is. I don't care if you wake up one day and your husband has left you or your wife has left you, if your children have abandoned you. If you've lost your job, if you lost your car, lost all your money, you have nothing but the clothes you have. I, I don't care how bad it is. This life we have, it is a gift. And so you never take that gift and throw it away. Never. You might say, Austin, you don't know how bad it is. No matter how bad any day is, the sun will set. And tomorrow, the sun will rise again. So you have to have a Christian, biblical understanding of life and death. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And he has a home prepared for us. You've heard my father say that we're not the faith police. And so if someone is fighting a fight in their body, if their, 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 their perspective is, I'm just going to believe God, we, we stand in faith and agreement with them. Their perspective is, I'm going to believe God, but I'm also going to do some things in the natural. We're, we're going to stand in faith and agreement with them. If their perspective is, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do this treatment, I'm going to believe for good results, we'll, we'll stand in faith in agreement with them. We're not the faith police. And it's important that in your life you learn what faith is and how faith works and you learn how to believe God because in this world there's trouble and we have to know how to fight the good fight of faith. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and he has a home prepared for us. The past few weeks I went to see one of our precious senior members. She had fought a fight of faith in her body. When I went to see her, you know, the Lord always perfectly orders our timing. Went to see her and she, she told me she, she was done. She was ready to go home to be with the Lord. And she was there in the hospital, but she said that the desire of her heart was that she be able to go to her home and from her home, step into the presence of the Lord. And so her, her husband, and I, we stood there and we prayed the prayer of agreement. And it made me so happy a few days later to hear that the Lord honored her request and the Lord honored the desire of her heart. She was able to go home and she was able to step into the presence of the Lord from home. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And he has a home prepared for us. And there we will see loved ones who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. We will see those who have gone on before us. And yes, I know that the Lord is coming. His coming is sooner today than it was yesterday. I finished church Wednesday evening and was making my way out. And the ushers were laughing because in Daughters of Faith, they talked about the rapture and end times. And Michaela, God bless her, she had a thousand questions. So I said, well, you need to wait till your grandpa is home and you can ask him all your questions. <laughs> the Lord is coming. But if he tarries, this body, this flesh can wear out. 
In the early years of the church, my parents grieved over an older church member passing. The Lord told my father, said, son, if I tarry sooner or later, they will all die. So again, we must have a biblical perspective about death. 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 13 says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with the loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Does God raise the dead? Yes. Paul calls Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the firstborn from among the dead. Does God raise the dead? Yes. And will God raise the dead? Yes. If the Lord tarries, the body, the flesh wears out, our spirit goes to be with the Lord, but the body is put in the ground. There's coming a day when we will receive a new resurrection body. Does God raise the dead? Yes. Will God raise the dead? Yes. Acts 9, verse 36, in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated as Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room, and all the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room, then he got down on his knees and prayed. We would get better results if in difficult situations we would first pray and seek the Lord. And then we see what Peter do what Jesus did. Again, as I rehearse to you, he was there at Nain when Jesus touched that box that boy was being carried in. He, he was there when Jesus spoke to Jairus' daughter, to Luther Kuhn, I say to you, little girl, get up. Peter was there when Jesus said to Lazarus, come forth. And so Peter did what Jesus did. Verse 40, turning to the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. The Bible says she opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. Now Luke doesn't tell us how she felt. To be with the Lord one moment to be in the city of God one moment, and then to be back there in Lydda. The, 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 or in Joppa, excuse me. The, the Bible doesn't tell us how she felt about it. Again, Paul tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But it says in verse 40, he spoke to her, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. So Peter prayed. Peter got direction. Then Peter did what Jesus did. He gave a word of command. Tabitha's spirit returned to her body. She opened her eyes, but she still had to do what Peter said do. She had to get up. Whatever, we, we don't know what the sickness was. We don't know what the situation was, but whatever it was, she had to will to live, to live again. She had to take action. Seeing Peter, she sat up. Verse 41, he took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. He called the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. Verse 42, this became known all over Joppa. Many people believed in the Lord. And that's what it's all about. 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 Every miracle, every testimony, every answer to prayer, a, a child being healed, 
uh, an adult being healed of an impossible situation, some being saved, or like the testimony I read, a, a young girl who, who grew up in Mansfield, who grew up in this area, but not in church and not saved, getting saved, being baptized. It is all to declare the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. As Revelation says, as we sung about the one who was, who is, who is to come. That is the purpose of miracles. A little miracle, a big miracle, someone being healed, or in this case, Peter being used of the Lord to raise someone from the dead. This is the purpose of miracles. Verse 42, this became known all over Joppa and many people believed in the Lord. That's what Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. That's what Peter preached in Acts chapter 3. Signs and wonders and miracles. And we would say, answered prayer. It is all proof. Jesus is alive. He's not in the grave. He is alive. And he is seated at the right hand of Father God. And he is coming for us again. Signs and wonders advertise the kingdom of God. Signs and wonders testify to the fact that Jesus is alive, risen from the dead. And this is the biblical book of Acts purpose for signs, wonders, miracles, people coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This became known all over Joppa and many people believed in the Lord. In Acts chapter nine, we see this is the result of miracles. Verse 35, people saw, they turned to the Lord. We saw that last Sunday, today, Many people believed in the Lord. Pastor and I believe that God's will for us in 2024 is that as Acts 9 tells us that we have a time of peace, being strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, growing in numbers as we live in the fear of God. As you live a blessed life, as you live a life of miracles and answered prayer, don't keep it all to yourself. Tell others. Tell others about the goodness of God. Tell others about the love of God. Tell others about the grace of God. My, my father pointed out at 9 a.m. that Peter helped her. That's who we're to be, the hands and the feet of Jesus. That when we hear about this challenge or that challenge or this situation or that situation, that we not be judgmental but that we extend a helping hand. That's who we're to be as the body of Christ in the hands and feet of Jesus. So don't, don't keep the goodness of God to yourself. Tell others. Tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ, that he lived for them, that he paid the price for their sins, that he is alive, that he still does miracles today, that he still saves today, he still heals today, he still delivers today. He still blesses today. He still fills the hearts of hungry men and women with his spirit today. As Peter would go on to preach in Acts 10, 38, Jesus went around doing good and healing all. But it's not good news if that was only true in the past. It is good news if that is still the case today. And Hebrews 10, 38 says, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he is still saving today, healing today, delivering today, blessing today, filling the hearts of hungry men and women with his spirit today. He is still, as Peter preached, doing good and healing all. So in this new year, let's all do a better job of telling everyone around us about the goodness of God and the fact that Jesus is alive. That, that's the gospel. That's good news. He is alive. And as proof or evidence that he is alive, he can turn this situation in your life around. He can change this situation in your life. In 2024, let's all do a better job of telling others. And my father and I believe that if we'll do that, we'll have a time of peace. 
We'll be strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. We'll grow in numbers as we live in the fear of the Lord. You might say, Austin, you keep mentioning that word fear. Biblically, the fear of God is holy, righteous, reverent respect. As a father, I don't want my children to fear me in the sense that they're afraid, but I want them to have a healthy, reverent respect that when I say, cut it out, they cut it out. And when I say stop, they stop. When I say be nice, I expect, man, y'all better be nice to each other, not just the next five minutes. Biblical fear of the Lord is a healthy, reverent respect that he is the almighty God. And there's coming a day when the Lord Jesus Christ is coming for us. And for those of us that believe in him, we will stand before him. We will give an account for our lives. We'll be rewarded. And then we will lay down every gift, every treasure, every reward. And as we sang in that last song, we will worship him. That's what fear of the Lord means. Please bow your heads. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. We'd all like to believe that we have all the time in the world. But friend, the truth is that we do live in a sinful fallen world. The truth is that there is an enemy, there is a deceiver, there is a devourer at work and he, he steals and he kills and he destroys. And so, yes, you better be right with God. Yes, you better surrender your life to God. Yes, you better make Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior of your life. Yes, you better stop playing games with God and playing games with church. You, you might have everyone around you fooled and convinced that you know the Lord. But friend, God knows. He knows our hearts. This world we live in, it'll lie to you to tell you that if you're just kind of good enough, that's enough. You'll be in heaven someday, friends. That is a lie. The Bible says that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We're all in need of a savior. His name is Jesus Christ. This world we live in, it'll lie to you. It'll tell you that you can come up with your own path to God. You can make your own way. You, you can choose the terms for yourself on which you approach God. It's a lie. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He is the Savior of the world. And the only way to know God, the only way to be a part of the family of God is by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and the Savior of your life. If you're here today and say, Austin, I've never done that, but I want to. I want to give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be a part of the family of God. If that's you, wherever you're seated, raise your hand to where I'll see it and I'll know you want me to pray with you. Say, Austin, pray with me. I want to ask Jesus Christ into my heart and into my life. I want to be a part of the family of God. You might also be here today and time in your life, you prayed a prayer, you walked an aisle, but you, you know in your heart you've not been living for God. You've been doing your own thing and you have paid the price. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says that God is good and God is wonderful and God is gracious and he is merciful. His, his mercy endureth forever. You can leave here today knowing that you have peace with God. If you're here today and say, Austin, pray with me. I want to recommit my life. I want to make things right with God before I go. If that's you, wherever you're seated, raise your hand where I'll see it and I'll know you want me to pray with you. For the sake of anyone watching or listening online now or later, we're going to pray. Pray this way with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you 
in the name of Jesus. And I repent of my sins. And I ask Jesus to be my Lord, to be my Savior. I give my life to you. Set me free of anything that would hinder me in living for you. Thank you for filling me and my heart with your life and your Holy Spirit. Thank you for setting me free of anything that would hinder me in living for you. I give you my life and I thank you. I'm a part of your family in Jesus' name. If that was for you watching or listening online or maybe didn't raise your hand, but you know in your heart, that was for you. If you're online, go to the address on the screen. We'll send you a Bible. We'll send you a short book to help you get started in living the Christian life, God's very own child. If you're here this morning and didn't want to raise your hand, but the Lord is dealing with you and dealing with your heart after the service, see an usher, see a, see a prayer partner, see someone at guest services. They'll talk with you. They'll pray with you. They'll put some things in your hands to be a blessing to you. Life, life, it is a gift. It is a gift. And so we have to live every day as if it matters. We have to live every day to the best of our ability. We have to live every day to the Lord. I've used my father-in-law as an illustration when he faced a serious health challenge and was in ICU for weeks and weeks and weeks and came to and came off all the various things that they, they had him on. He, he, he didn't know all that had gone on, what was going on. So the idea that you just live however you want and then there'll be a day and you can hand a loved one a list and say, well, get all these 25 people up here so I can make these situations right and ask their forgiveness. There's no guarantee of any of that. We have to live every day under the Lord. We have to live every day ready to meet the Lord. Life, it is a gift. And it is the greatest gift. And as I said during the message, I meant it. I don't, I don't care how blue or how down or how low anyone gets. I don't care how bad the situation is. We, we never throw away the greatest gift that God has given. And if sometimes you're in a service on a Sunday or Wednesday and you hear my father and I make a comment about a substance that hurts your feelings, you'll just have to forgive us. We love you, the people of God. And we want, to live, we want you to live a long life. We want you to live a healthy life, amen. We want you to have God's best in every area of life. Just yesterday I read about a young pastor my age, and he's gone. He's in eternity because he mixed alcohol with two different prescription drugs, and he leaves behind a wife and small children. Good news is that Jesus is alive. And he saves today, he heals today. But if you're struggling with an bondage, an addiction, a substance, if the Lord Jesus Christ can raise your decaying body out of the grave and give you a new resurrection body, I don't care whether you struggle with anxiety or worry. I don't care whether you struggle with marijuana. I don't care if you struggle with the hard drug. If the Lord Jesus Christ can raise your body from the grave. The Lord Jesus Christ can set you free. So, you say, I believe that you are alive. The one who was, who is, who is to come. And so I ask you to set me free. And he will. He will. This Life, it is, it is a gift. Amen.